oh, wow, don't clap before. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get, right? <laughs> OK, so um, thank you for letting me come. Um, I, as um, Mariana mentioned, I work for the Bear River Health Department. Been there about 15 years. Uh, I work as a health educator for the health department. So I do a variety of different health classes, which is really fun. My best day in the office is the day that I'm not, that I'm out and about. So I appreciate you letting me come out and visit with you today. So Mar Mariana called me and asked if I could come and speak on healthy relationships. And I said to her first, I'm, I'm not a counselor or anything like that. She's like, yeah, that's good. I know that. So um, what I have is a variety of different um, grants that we work on through the health department. Um, we focus on this topic in a variety of different ways, anywhere from working with teens and doing some prevention work as far as alcohol use, underage drinking, um, early sexual activity with teen pregnancy prevention and things like that. So there's a variety of stuff that you'll see in here. And I've also focused a lot of the presentation on um, just healthy relationships amongst us as far as our partners, uh, our coworkers, friends, family, things like that as well. So I encourage questions, um, encourage feedback. Uh, I'd like to have a little bit of discussion with this, so feel free to, to be part of that. So just to get started, um, I'm going to first start with just kind of an overview of the topics that I'll talk about. And again, I encourage questions, so if you have any thoughts along the way, please just get my attention. So we're going to talk most heavily about building connections. That's really the whole focus of the presentation, is about building powerful, uh, positive connections through relationships. Um, we're going to talk and spend some time on distractions as well, because uh, we know that there are a lot of distractions out there, right? Um, there's just lots of things that uh, bid for our time, honestly. And so we're going to talk about that because those can often be a challenge and can um, interfere with some of those connections that we have with others. Uh, we're also going to talk about the power behind um, being a parent and being a partner and just what we bring to the table, how much influence we actually have. Uh, so we want to make sure that everyone understands that there's a lot that we can give and a lot that we can contribute and then some of the things that we should expect from relationships as well. We are also going to talk about tapping into support. Uh, our community has experienced some loss. Um, over the years we've had um, some very serious loss when it comes to suicide in our community, um, even as, as, you know, uh, like last week. Uh, we have had some serious issues, and we want to talk about that. Down at the health department, we do some, um, some resource, we have some resources, and we do some presentations on suicide prevention and things like that as well. So we want to make sure that we're tapping into resources, that we're uh, boosting our level of strength and resiliency in the community, and working together to help combat that. And so uh, just the bottom one just talks more about resources that are available within our community. And I'll touch on some of those and give you um, some links to some others. So getting started here, um, building connections. Uh, basically, we want to identify a few healthy traits first. And I'm just going to go ahead and throw those up there. Um, when we, first of all, when we're building connections and we are forming relationships, they could be relationships with significant others that we're in a committed relationship with. It could, again, be coworkers or employers or employees. It could be the lady at the grocery store that's at the checkout counter. It could be our neighbors, um, our children, for sure. I mean, there's just a variety of different relationships. So as we go through this information, you know, it'll vary um, for each different type of relationship. But kind of keep these in mind just as a general um, tool. So some of the healthy traits when we're entering into a relationship we want to think about that we probably want to have um, very, uh, we at least want to have some shared goals, some shared values, and be heading at least in the general direction. Now, having said that, uh, we're all very individual. We have individual personalities and traits, and we have a bunch of different strengths that we bring to the table. And those differences are great and should be embraced. Like, if we were all the same, life would be really super boring, right? So we want to em embrace that difference um, but we also need to probably align ourselves with people that are like-minded, right? That's probably going to be a, a stronger connection for us. Uh, I'll talk more a, a little bit about assertive communication, but I wanted to bring up assertiveness here and just talk about how assertiveness is just basically um, being respectful um, of others and also honoring and respecting ourselves, okay? That's really what um, assertiveness is about, honoring other people's uh, thoughts and feelings, 
but also honoring our own, um, and kind of um, standing true to ourselves. Also, um, when we enter into a relationship, it's probably pretty important that we have a similar level of commitment and investment of time. So we want it to be a two-way street. We don't want someone to be giving 90-10, uh, you know, 90% while the other person's 10%. And that happens sometimes. We'll talk more about that in a little bit too. Um, I also want to focus on forgiveness. Forgiveness is very important. Forgi forgiveness is great, right? Those days when we're less than our best, when we just kind of have an ugly day and we're having a difficult time being positive and helpful and approachable, aren't we glad that people will give us the grace to, to forgive us and see the goodness despite kind of having a bad day? And we need to also um, be gracious and do that for others as well. We need to be able to see past some of those challenges that people are facing and um, help lift them up and help support them, which is the next item, uh, the next bullet item, but help be supportive of them as well so that they can move through that difficult day as well. So along with building connections, it's really important that we have healthy communication. Um, and there are a bunch of different communication styles. Um, you've heard of like someone that's passive where they just kind of roll with the flow, which sounds great in theory. It sounds wonderful if you're partnered up with someone that's passive because then it's always your way, right? You get to decide everything. But that puts a lot of pressure on us and puts a lot of responsibility on us if we're not the passive one to, to kind of foster that and to move that relationship forward. So passive is, is something that um, we, we take turns at at different times. We all have uh, good and bad days and, and that kind of thing. But when we're, when we're passive, it's more roll with the flow and it's not quite as engaged or quite as interactive. So um, we want to be aware of that. But what we would like to strive towards is being more assertive. And again, that's honoring and re being respectful of other people's thoughts, feelings, um, ideas, and then also honoring our own um, as well. And kind of sometimes we have to stand firm for that. and We have to hold true to ourselves. Uh, the other type of style of communication is um, often aggressive, okay? So we've got passive, um, and then we've got on the direct opposite side of that, we've got aggressive. And aggressive communication is basically my way or the highway, where um, there's not a lot of room for giving. So again, 90-10, when I talked about that a second ago, that's the 90, it's all my way, okay? I'm very um, inflexible. So you can see those different ways. And uh, different communication styles kind of manifest in communication as well. Some of us are, I just want the facts, ma'am. Just give it to me straight. That's kind of like my husband. When, when he asks me how was my day, he wants to hear, is it, was it good or was it bad? And unfortunately for him, I'm kind of a let me tell you the story kind of gal. So he wants, I just want the facts, ma'am, but he's going to get the story. So he's going to get why my day was great or why my, why my day was not so great. And he's going to get it from 6 o'clock in the morning until whatever went went really well or went really bad, he's going to get what I'll build up to that and what my frame of mind was. <clears throat> so thankfully he's patient with me and, and he works through that with me. But that's something that we need to consider as we enter into a relationship as well, that those, those differing communication styles uh, can be a little bit challenging to, um, to work with. So we need to be thinking of that as we're, as we're uh, developing these connections. Another thing that's really, really critical for healthy communication is eye contact. And just as I'm standing, you know, amongst you guys today and I make eye contact with you, um, that helps me know that you're valuing my presence here, that you're um, respectful of my message. Doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with it. It just means that you're giving me the respect and showing me some time and um, sharing your energy and sharing your, um, your time, which is really important. So eye contact is very, very critical. I know um, just like raising my kids growing up, I, I think back now about all the things that I should or shouldn't have done, of, of course. And I think about some of the times when they'd come in after school and they'd say, and, and I would say to them as they'd come home, how was your day, right? That's kind of the mom thing that we do. And uh, I'd be standing at the sink fixing dinner or getting dishes done or whatever, and they would come in and, and I'd ask the question and they would proceed to tell me a little bit or, you know, as they got older and a little more quiet and a little less sharing as in their teen years, they, they may not share quite as much. But had I, you know, dried my hands, sit down with them, made direct eye contact and said, how was your day? And showed them a little bit more respect and value in that way, my conversations with them probably would have been drastically different. 
So we need to really make a point that eye contact is really, really critical. And there's a lot less eye contact and a good firm handshake going on in the world. Have you noticed that? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways to connect. There's a lot of different um, social media and apps and things like that where we can connect with people. But nothing replaces the fact when you're person to person and you're reading body language and you have that direct eye contact and you can gauge um, and understand and communicate more effectively, for sure. So I put active listening. They go hand in hand. Active listening is more than just hearing what someone says. Active listening is actually hearing what they're saying, listening intently, listening to get the best understanding from that person as possible. It's not so much about listening so that you can formulate your response. It's not thinking about what you're going to say when it gets to be your turn when they stop talking, right? It's about listening intently, giving that person that respect to understand what's going on in their mind and kind of get the best overall picture of what they're trying to convey to you. So that's really, really critical. Active listening is something that we all should try to work harder to do. I, I believe that um, it, it's easy for us to, to get distracted and have challenges that way, but it's really critical that we do that. So um, respectful language is another important key part of um, healthy communication. And respectful language, I just try to always remind myself before, before I have a redhead moment and I'm going to go off on somebody, I try to ask myself, okay, what's coming out of my mouth? Is it going to be helpful? So if it's not going to be helpful, then maybe I need to rethink it, spend a little more time in processing before I actually let it go. Okay, that's really, really critical. Respectful language is... Again, we can have differing opinions and we can have different um, ideas. That's totally fine. Again, we would be really super boring if we were all the same. But respectful language is just asking, would it be, will this be helpful? What can I say to help the situation instead of make it worse? What can I say that's not going to turn around later and I'm going to regret it? Or I'm going to cause pain that, or maybe some irreparable damage to this, to this relationship. So that's really, really key, just trying to remind yourself of that. And that goes along with cooperation and negotiation. Um, I mentioned earlier about 90-10, and we hear all the time like marriage is supposed to be 50-50. What do you think? Marriage 50-50? Depends on the day, doesn't it? It does. It depends on the day. And so 50-50, sometimes it's 60-60, <laughs> right? Some days, like when my husband's asking me how was my day, and I want to go tell him this whole story, he's trying really hard to just be quiet and just not cut me off and go, I just want the facts, ma'am, right? So um, that cooperation and that negotiation is an ongoing thing. And some days, you know, we have bad days. And so some days we don't give it our best effort and we're not fully present and we're not fully engaged. Some days we may be less than respectful. That makes, makes it so that when it is our day that we're supposed to be full on for our partner, for our spouse, for our employees, for our customers, whatever it is, that we, we think back through that and we are more cooperative and, and we negotiate that in a healthier way. And then the last two I just wanted to add too as far as healthy communication, we should strive to always be open and honest. Okay? Again, we can have differing opinions, we can disagree, but we should be open, we should be honest, we should ask, you know, is this going to be helpful? How can I convey this and be respectful um, and still stay true to myself? Those are all very critical things to keep in mind. Okay, so distractions. Many, many distractions, right? Lots and lots of distractions. I've, I've got a few here I'm going to list. Um, so I am so thankful that I work for the Bear River Health Department. It's been a great place. Uh, I've been there, like I said, for 15 years. Uh, and I enjoy my job a lot. Matter of fact, one of the things that I struggle with is leaving my job and going home and just disconnecting because I think about it a lot because I care about it and I'm very passionate about it. Uh, but I have to also make a commitment to those people that I care about, that I love, and say, you know, tonight I can't just talk all about everything that I did with Fox Elder County. It was a great day, and I was so thankful to get to come hang out with these cool people, but I can't spend all my evening hours doing that, and that takes away from my spouse and I's relationship. So with work, we need to make a commitment that we're going to be home to have dinner with our family, if at all possible. And sometimes that works, and sometimes that doesn't. Uh, we're going to try not to talk shop when we're out to dinner as couples or when we're around the family dinner table. We're going to try to leave a little bit of less of that um, aside so that we can focus more intently on our relationships. Now, by all means, if something happens at work 
that is a good learning um, experience for your family where you want to share something that, you know, some strength that you developed or some challenge that you faced and was able to overcome, definitely share those things. Those are good teaching moments. But um, we want to make sure that we leave work um, and not um, take that home and, and, and have that be a distraction with our families. Children can be a distraction, right? Uh, some of us choose to get married and some of us choose to have children and some of us choose to not, and that's fine too. But children, oftentimes in relationships, as great as they are and as important as it is for us to fully give to them and be present for them, oftentimes relationships suffer because the kids are sitting between us. And though we created them together, we need to like make sure that we stay strong as a, as a unit too. Even when um, relationships end, we still need to be thinking about how we can work best towards being um, strong for our children in that way. Family, friends, those kinds of things can also be a distraction, okay? So it, it might be great for the whole family, the extended family, to get together and go camping and to go boating and doing all these great things, but also sometimes it's good to say, you know what, it's just gonna be us this weekend. We're just gonna take some time and just have us time this weekend, and that, that's, that's uh, very healthy as well. And friends, while they're very important, sometimes we have tighter relationship with friends than we do with family even. And that's, that's, that's okay to some degree, and um, we need to foster those relationships, but we also need to make sure that they're not a distraction for those core relationships that are really, really vital to us. I put social media up too because um, this is honestly one of my peeves, <laughs> one of my pet peeves is that social media, I think what's created, I think the whole basis of that was to increase connections, right? And you hear stories all the time how people connect with a high school, um, you know, a high school classmate or something from 40 years ago. Or sometimes, I just heard recently about one in the news where they found their mother. They were adopted and they found their mother. So those kinds of things happen. But by far and large, a lot of the social media actually serves as a distraction when we have people that are in the same room together having a conversation through their thumbs, right? We miss a lot when we communicate through, uh, when we connect. When we connect through social media, it can be great, but we can miss a lot. We can miss that sense of desperation, frustration, that feeling of over, over being overwhelmed. We can miss that in someone's voice when we're not having that connection with them. We can miss body language. When somebody says, um, doing great, is that, I'm doing great, or is that, yeah, I'm doing great. We can miss some of that. That's really, really important when it comes to communication. So there's a lot of people that struggle, and no one has a clue, or they're surprised by that, but because they seem like everything that they're seeing on social media seems happy and positive and great, but they're not seeing and, and uh, being able to, to feel that full connection. Hobbies are great, and we should explore those, and we should have things that we enjoy and can look forward to, but hobbies can be a distraction, too, from critical relationships. So if we love to shop, or we love to um, snowmobile, or we love to watch sports on hours on end, or shop, or or craft, or whatever it is, that's great. But we need to make sure that they're not serving as a distraction for those core connections and those core relationships. So what I would suggest is finding those things that you love that help you de-stress and all of that, and share them with the people that you care about. Um, and um, you know, invite them in if they, if they would like to. Uh, it's funny, driving here from the road sheds this morning, there's, this, there's two great big huge fields of horses. You guys know where I'm kind of talking, you know where the big bull is out there. Two great big huge fields of horses, and I love horses. And it's so funny how certain things kind of dawn on you. I'm driving through, and I see these horses, and it finally, I finally got it with my husband. My husband, some of our dates have been going and sitting at the Salt Lake, at the, at the end of the runway, at the end of the airport, you know, out in the back, kind of out on the west side, or out on the east side of the, the airport, and just watching planes come in. He loves to do that. And I'm like, this is so boring, like watching airplanes just coming in, wow, okay, that's great, well, let's do it, let's do it, and I'll take a snack, because that'll, that'll appease me, but as watching those horses out in the field, on my drive here this morning, I'm like, I could just sit and watch those horses for hours, 
And it finally dawned on me, that's what my husband gets out of those airplanes. So share things that you enjoy. Make those negotiations. Make those compromises. Share your time like that. And encourage and support one another in the things that they love. It's also important that we do allow space. Sometimes some of us need that time in the gym just to kind of work things out, and we just need to be on our own and do whatever we need to do. Or we need to have that quiet time in the craft room where we're building and creating and, and having that expression um, and, and de-stressing in that way. Or it might be out working in the shop, um, you know, creating and building something entirely different out there. But, so we need to allow that space, but we just also need to make sure that it's not creating a distraction in our relationships. Okay, talking about the, the power um, of parents, the power of partners, really, regardless if we're in a committed relationship, regardless if we are a parent, um, we have the power to influence the way other people feel. And we need to be thinkful, thinking about that, and we need to be thinking about how we can build resiliency not only for ourselves, but for our families, for our children, for our partners, and also for our community. It's really, really critical. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and throw these up, up there. Um, Eric Greetens is a former U.S. Navy SEAL, and he shared this information. It's really geared more for parenting, for, for kids. But really, I feel like it serves across all connections and relationships. It really can help with, um, with all of those different interactions. So building resiliency um, by setting a great positive example, okay? Uh, taking responsibility. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to make mistakes, and that's okay. That's okay, that's how we learn. Um, and I, I have a few favorite quotes. So one of my favorite quote, quotes is, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. So those days that we have a win and everything goes our way, that's great, that's a great feeling. We'll take more of those, right? But some days things kind of like splatter and they don't go so well. And when that happens, often that's when we reflect and we go, you know, I had something to do with that. And I could have had a different impact. Or I could have spent a little more time in preparation with that. A lot of times we learn what we need to do for self-improvement. And sometimes we learn that things are just simply out of our control. And that wasn't our problem in the first place. Or maybe I need some assistance with that problem. So take responsibility when we mess up. That's OK. That's part of life. Um, move forward and learn from it. And then serve others. I think it's really, really cool when we have the opportunity to pull people that we love and that we care about in with us to help serve others. So help them help others is kind of my key with that. Um, so we always get back way more than we get, than what we attribute to, you know, provide for people when we serve others. It's, it's such a good experience. And we learn a lot about ourselves, and we learn about people that are facing difficulties and uh, just by reaching out and serving them. Another important factor, I, um, I agree with Eric completely, is to pra practice daily gratitude, just being thankful for the little things. Okay, You hear about gratitude journals and things like that, but just taking the time each day to like think about what you're really thankful for. And it might not be, well, I'm thankful for my house, I'm thankful for my job, I'm thankful for my health. Those are all great, wonderful things to be thankful for. But it might be, I'm thankful that I got to drive by and see those horses and make that connection that my husband loves those planes and I need to try harder to understand that. I'm thankful that I learned that today. Okay, I'm grateful for that opportunity. So thank you, Mariana, for allowing me to go out to the road sheds and have that nice little drive. Um, so practicing daily gratitude is really, really important. And then this next one is, I, I totally hear this. I'm reading a book right now called The One Minute Manager. And it's, it talks about letting other people's problems be their problems. Okay? Some of us are fixers. Somebody brings us a problem, whether it's an employee or an employer or um, a spouse or a child. They'll bring us and they'll say, well, what am I going to do? And they hand it off to us. And if we take it and we own that and then we try to fix it, Sometimes we have to do that, right? But oftentimes, if we say, wow, that is a big problem, how are you going to fix that? What's your strategies? And we hand it back to them. We allow them to practice self-reliance, and we help them develop problem-solving skills. So sometimes the problems that we're trying to fix to manage our daily life are not our problems to fix. So it's important to try to distinguish that and hand those back. Okay, more of Eric 
Cretans here. He talks about be a mentor, not a savior, is actually what his, his terminology was. So mentor people, guide people, assist people, but you don't have to be everyone's hero. Let them be their own hero sometimes. It kind of goes along with what, what I was just talking about. So we don't have to run in and save the day every time. We need to allow other people to do that as well. And again, that fosters growth. Uh, assert authority when needed. So there are times when we need to stand our ground, when we need to put our foot down, when we need to be a parent, not a friend, when we need to um, actually um, hold someone accountable. That's really important as well. So we need to assert that authority when it's needed. We just need to be respectful, use that respectful language, uh, ask how can I help, um, that kind of thing. And encourage appropriate risk taking. So I nearly chose a different picture, um, but I thought I better make it a little nicer, but it was actually a bird like kicking a baby out of the nest. Um, but it's that we gotta, we gotta encourage appropriate risk taking. It's good to step out of our comfort zone, even though that can be scary um, and a little bit um, overwhelming at times, that's where we see our most growth, is when we step out of our comfort zone and we encourage that risk. And especially with our kids, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of kind of the, the terminology fragile generation. Have any of you heard of that? So fragile generation is kind of talking about how we drive our kids to school every day instead of letting them walk a block and a half. Like we're worried that they're gonna get kidnapped, which I guess could happen, but probably not very high chances. So that, that exercise walking to school could be great for them. It could, it, it could um, foster confidence that they're capable of getting themselves from point A to point B. But we, we have kind of created this generation where we do a lot of things for them that they could really do for themselves. And we save them a lot of hardship because as children ourselves, we always try to make it better for the next generation. And sometimes that's great, but sometimes that cuts away from them learning important life lessons as well and developing skills that they're gonna need when they travel into adulthood. So encourage appropriate risk taking them. Um, encourage them, praise them when they're bold. Even if things don't work out so well, even if they try out for the spelling bee and it doesn't quite work out or they run for student council or your spouse applies for an, an interviews for a new job and it doesn't quite work out. Like praise them for being bold and for trying and stepping out of their comfort zone. And it's really critical that we allow and accept failure. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes, sometimes we win and sometimes we fail, right? Um, and that's okay, we need to foster that with our kids. Not everybody can be the valedictorian. Not everybody can be first place. It's okay, not everybody needs a trophy, okay? I don't believe so anyway. Um, I think it's okay when we have those things happen to us that we learn that that just helps us to learn to do better or learn that maybe that's not our greatest strength. Maybe that's not even our calling. So we need to kind of accept that and, and move forward. But as parents, oops, I don't know what happened there. As parents, we need to um, be okay with that. Let our kids learn, let our kids grow, let our kids make mistakes, let our kids work through all of that and just kind of love them through it. And same with our spouses and with our coworkers even. Again, we have to be accountable, but we need to also take some risks once in a while. And if we have to hold back on anything, I would say hold back on anger. Hold back on anger. Ask yourself before you let that go, is it helpful, as I mentioned earlier, but please don't ever hold back on expressing love. Um, we want to make sure that people know that they're cared about, that, they're, that they serve a value in your life, that they have purpose, that they have meaning, that they are contributors to your life and your happiness, we want to express that freely. We don't ever want to hold back on that. So moving forward a little bit more with kind of that power, that influence that we all have, we have the influence, believe it or not, to make someone's day just by simply giving them a free gift. We can give them a smile. That's a free gift. We, we could give those away all day long and we're never going to be out a darn thing. So when we're going through the grocery line and we sense that somebody's kind of having a rough day and they're not quite as courteous as you would hope for your service. Um, maybe you take a little bit of responsibility on there and exert your influence and see if you can turn that around for them. Okay, building those connections again. Uh, it's just really, really vital. We have a lot of power within us to make some changes there. Um, working together, again, to build resiliency and coping skills. Unfortunately, our nation, society in general, really struggles with this. 
And it's not just our young people. We hear a lot about kids not having good coping skills anymore, but it's our generation too. We're not quite as adept at coping as we once were. Uh, we need to foster that more and we need to build that personal strength. So Parents Empowered is a statewide media campaign, actually, and it is really focused on preventing underage drinking. But you'll see how this all kind of ties in here in just a little bit. They have some really good core strategies that really go along well with preventing a lot of unhealthy behaviors and a lot of um, ways that we can foster stronger connections with, with our kids specifically. But again, we can think about this uh, more generally with other relationships as well. So parentsempowered.org, you're welcome to go there and check out some great stuff that they have. But one of the th things that they did at the very early stages of, of preparing for this campaign was they did a study um, of kids and parents. And they did some focus groups and they asked some questions. And they asked teenagers, they said, and they asked parents, they asked the same question. They said, what would you say is the greatest influence on your kids? Who is the greatest influence on your kids? So when the parents were asked that, they said, well, they're friends, of course, those peers. They're so vital. They don't even listen to us. They tune us out. It's all about their friends. So their friends are very important. They spend more time with their teachers than they do with us. And they're constantly exposed to media messaging. So, you know, we're there. We're present. But there's a lot of influences that are greater than us. That's what the parents said when they were asked at the focus group. When the kids were asked the same question, you see where they put parents? They said, we need guidance. We want their direction. We want their involvement. We need them to be engaged. We rely on them as our primary influence of how we make decisions. Family was next. Okay, Friends were there, for sure. Friends, friends are definitely critical. Um, so that's pretty powerful. We sell ourselves short sometimes as parents and say, well, you know, there's so much fighting for our kids' time. And, only halfway listening to us anyway. Again, we need to foster that by drying our hands from the kitchen towel, sitting down, making eye contact, and having that more deep connection with them. So the three strategies that uh, Parents Empowered really focuses on is bonding, boundaries, and monitoring. We'll go through those a little bit um, together. But bonding is really about um, sharing time and commitment and fostering that healthy connection there so that they know that they're valued, they know that they matter, they know that, um, that they can count on us, things like that. Boundaries are basically the fences. They're the, the guides. They're the things that protect us, for protect our kids. So just like we fence in that beautiful fenced-in area of horses, or our cows, or our chickens, or our dog, we put up fences or boundaries to protect them, don't we? That's to keep them from harm. Okay. Boundaries are the same thing with our kids. They need to be very clear and laid out. They need to be consistent. They need to be very um, similar and, and, and fluid in that way. Um, and so when we set up boundaries, kids understand them. They understand the consequences that go with them. So we're very clear in that way. And then monitoring is also another piece um, of Parents Empowered. And it's just basically asking questions, checking in, making sure that we know where our kids are, know where, who they're hanging out with, that kind of thing. Again, with other relationships, it's the same thing. Hi, honey, I know you had to travel the canyon today. Did you make it home all right? It's not about stalking. It's not about being overly possessive. It's about that committed, I care about you. I want to know that you're OK. If you're not, I want to know how I can help. It's that kind of thing. So a little bit more about each of these. Um, bonding is, again, about creating a positive, loving home environment. It's being respectful, using that respectful language. It's about participating in family activities together. Uh, again, it could be going to grandma's. It could be, um, you know, it could be eating dinner together. Simple as eating dinner together. There have been studies that show that um, teen use of alcohol and drugs drastically decreases if they have uh, dinner with their family at least five times a week. Drastically reduces just by having that simple connection in the evening of that consistency, uh, that kind of thing. I, you know, we talk about social media and all of that kind of stuff and the connection with that, but I really feel like we need to start a movement more that, that values and puts more importance on front and back porch swings. I think that's where the new thing should be. Instead of all these new apps, like there's a new app that comes out every day. I think we need to focus more on those 
simple times where we sit and converse and share our goals and share our dreams and things like that. I think that's really, really important. And the dinner table can serve as that porch swing for us too, okay? I think that's really, really important. Instead of developing another new app, how we can connect in that way, just that good old fashioned direct face-to-face -face eye contact is really, really critical and it helps with that bonding um, yeah, experience. So the next one, boundaries, again, is just setting clear rules, um, how, helping other people understand the consequences and having consistent enforcement. Uh, it talks about um, sharing with your loved ones possible scenarios that they may face and helping them kind of work through those. Helping them think of ways, problem solving skills, um, you know, setting up a, setting up kind of a code that if you ever call me, if you're ever in a situation and you call me and you just need backup, that I won't ask questions, I won't grill you, I won't give you the lecture, I will just come respond and I will come get you. So mom, I'm ready to be picked up now, doesn't mean mom, I need to talk about how someone's being more than friendly at the party and there's alcohol and drugs here. That's not where, you know, we'll talk about that later, but let's get them safe and get them out of that environment first. Um, and it's also about asking for personal commitment from, from the other person that's in the relationship as well. It's kind of a twofold thing, like let's set up some boundaries, you have your boundaries, I have my boundaries, let's understand them fully and, um, and be respectful of them. So speaking of um, the scenario, um, my children, you know, empty nester, my children have been gone for a while, and um, my daughter, all grown up, you know, she still texts, you know, that's her form of communication with me. Uh, every once in a great while, I'll get a phone call from her. And um, it's kind of rare when I get a phone call from her. So, you know, first thing I want to say is, where's the blood? What's going on? Um, but I've kind of moved past that, because now um, if she's in a situation where she's feeling unsure, or um, I've noticed this over the last few years, if she's feeling unsure, she's feeling um, unsafe for some reason, reason, whether it's emotionally or physically, then that's when she calls me. So I try to answer her call when that happens, of course. And so when I see my, my daughter calling, I'll answer it. And one time she said to me, well, I'm in a dark alley. I'm on my way to this thing in Salt Lake, and I'm in a dark alley, so I just wanted to have somebody on the phone so I wasn't alone. And of course, as a mom, what's my first thought, first question, why are you in a dark alley? <laughs> but so I talked through that because she felt some level of connection that she had somebody on the other end. So if things went south, she at least had somebody on the other end, which is a horrifying feeling for me if something did go wrong. Um, but anyway, so I appreciate that I now recognize it's kind of her SOS when she makes a call to me instead of texting six or seven or eight times a day that she needs, she needs that validation, she needs to talk things through, and that's all part of kind of setting up some boundaries, but also being um, bonded and, and being supportive to one another. And she does that a lot for me as well, I have to admit. So monitoring, again, is just checking in, making sure that um, we know what kind of scenario our loved one is in, and um, making sure that they're safe, um, connecting, making sure that they know that we care about them, that they haven't been forgotten, that they're a deep connection for us. So part of that, again, uh, Parents Empowered, they did some focus groups. Um, oh, actually, this was a different focus group. This was a focus group that we conducted at the health department um, when we received a grant that was going to be um, teaching uh, teen sexual health. So teaching parents and teaching teens how to kind of maneuver pregnancy prevention, STD prevention, that kind of thing. So we, we gathered some parents together, we get, gathered some teens together, we asked some similar questions, and it was really interesting how we got uh, different responses entirely. But um, parents felt like their most important responsibility was uh, putting in place morals, values, beliefs, which the health department agrees with 100%. Um, we feel like that's the parent's role. And we try to assist with education uh, regarding health issues um, as we can, but we really want the parents to be the guide for that. And we actually have a class at the health department. It's called Families Talking Together. Uh, it's a great opportunity. It's, it's really not so much of a class as it is an in, it's a discussion, really. It's a couple hours long. You've, I'll be giving you some information on it. But it just kind of helps you open up conversations. And it's, guide, it's guided to um, help us talk to our kids about sex, but it's bigger than that. It's about any kind of risky health behavior, really, whether it's alcohol use or um, e-cigarettes or whatever, you can use all of that kind of foundational stuff to have those conversations. Uh, but parents um, want, wanted to emphasize risks um, 
and lots of opportunity. They were more concerned about things that their kids were going to miss out on if they made unhealthy choices. And they often think that they're having the talk with the kids. And again, this isn't kind of geared around sex education, but they think they're having the talk with their kids when they sit them down for a formal discussion. And that's, that's, that's one way of doing it. But what we suggest is to have a lifelong conversation. So we start early and we start often. And it's listening to things on the radio and, and hit and pause and saying, okay, as we take you to soccer practice and I hear this song and they're talking about this relationship, is that really a healthy relationship? Is that respectful way to talk about women? Like that's more of the talk to us from the health department's perspective, fostering healthy relationships and, and um, consent and things like that. Where teens, when we talk to them about um, risky behaviors, they felt like it was kind of cool and kind of glamorous and it's kind of that edgy, kind of the, the you know, forbidden fruit kind of uh, thought. And that it's not that big of a deal that all of us older people make such a big deal out of things. But we want to help with those connections and build that so that we can continue to assert that influence. Uh, they, they note that they receive most of their information about help from school, from health class, or friends. And again, as a health educator for, by profession, I really feel like the health of our children really starts with the parents providing that foundation. I'm happy to help with any kind of health education, but at the same time, we really want to be, um, as parents and family members, we want to be um, helpful that way. And a lot of the times, the kids will tell us, we just wish that we could have more open, non-judgmental conversations with our parents. And working with law enforcement and working with jails and um, even with some experience with prison type of settings, oftentimes what we hear from people is, what did you need? What got you to this point? And they'll say, I wish I would have had deep connection as a youth. I wish I would have known there was somebody there to go to bat for me. I wish I would have had a mentor that could have helped me maneuver some of that tricky, murky water. So those are really critical when we're thinking about building connections. Uh, moving over to tapping into support. Um, I'm going to list a variety of agencies in our community, some great resources. Um, we really have a lot of great things. We have the USU Extension that has all kinds of great 4-H programs for our kids and, and families, adults can get involved with that. We have Boys and Girls Club, same kind of thing. We have the New Hope Crisis uh, Center that offers a shelter for people that are in need of that during an unsafe time. They have a lot of different classes and resources and um, they can assist with some legal aid. Um, Family Support Center also has a lot of great parent resources. They have respite care, which is basically if we just need a break, we can take our kids, we can call and make an appointment or make an arrangement to, to meet them and they can help us with our kids if we're at a breaking point. Um, they can also help with that if we're going to a counseling session or a, a job interview, things like that. Uh, Pregnancy Care Center reaches out to a lot of um, young couples and individuals that are in that parenting role or pregnant or suspect that they may be pregnant. That's a great resource in our community. And then the health department, of course, I listed a few. I'm a little bit more familiar with some of the resources, but there's that families talking together that I mentioned. Uh, Parenting Wisely is another parent option that's basically a computer module if you're not comfortable going to a traditional parenting class. Um, you know, some people do really well with all that interaction and others just kind of like to be like processing it alone. So we have that option at the health department. It's free, you can just call and make, it, make an appointment with me. We also provide substance use and uh, mental health treatment. Oftentimes people understand that we do addiction kind of therapy, and we do that as well, obviously, but um, we can do mental health treatment as well. And we have put together a mental health resource guide that's available on our website, the brhd.org. That's available. Um, our health department's going through a little change right now, so um, it may be a little minute before you can access that, but um, you can also contact me I can get a copy to you, but it just puts, um, it has a guide with uh, different support groups in our community, different counseling that's available, uh, different classes, uh, just to help build and foster um, more positive mental health and um, yeah, just helping people as we um, uh, provide more connections, really. So tapping into support, um, what I want everyone to understand is, you know, when we see signs of someone struggling, again, we're, we not, we're not always going to catch it when we're Facebooking and things like that. But when we catch signs of someone that we know struggling, we need to ask some questions and we need to get involved. 
Health Department does some suicide prevention presentations as well. We'd love to share. Um, but really, our, one of our main focuses is to help reduce stigma. Life is hard, and it gets challenging. And we all have times when it's difficult. And I really want to make sure that people understand it's not weak to ask for help or to seek resources. That's actually wise. That's mature. That's the healthy thing that we need to do. We never think twice about going to the doctor when we have an injury or an illness. We never take any shame in that. And mental health is just like physical health. It's just another aspect of health. And we need to do all that we can to help tap ourselves into some resources to assist with that when we need it. And we all need it from time to time. Um, and I know that you have um, available to you also an EAP program through Blomquist Hill. So that's another resource that I didn't have listed on there that I'd also like to, to uh, reinforce. Um, but basically, just helping one another foster healthier coping strategies. Life can be wonderful and joyful, and it can be really messy and overwhelming and difficult at times, too. So just working together, um, trying to foster and grow and build those connections deeper and tighter and um, tapping into help when we need it. So again, there's a few more websites. Um, the Healthy Relationships Utah.org, that's actually um, USU Extensions. Uh, there's a lot of great information and classes and activities for kids, for dads, for couples, for individuals, um, finance. There's a lot of great stuff there. Um, like I said, we've got a variety of different things available at the health department as well. So in wrapping up, what I would like to challenge and encourage each one of you to do is just maybe take one little tidbit. Think about one little thing that you can do that when you're have when you have that quiet time, that little solitude time that doesn't happen very often in our busy world. But when we're taking the kids, or when we're drop, after we've dropped off the kids from soccer, to soccer practice, or we're on our way to work, or to the grocery store, or whatever, wherever it is, to think about one of these things, like thinking about daily gratitude, or thinking about how we can make a more concerted effort at making direct eye contact and active listening. But take something and just think about it and see how you can maybe have that implemented a little bit stronger, deeper into your life that could help to grow and foster a little bit tighter connections for each one of us. Any questions? Thoughts? Ideas of how you have implemented kind of growing those deeper connections in, in your families? Well, I appreciate your time today, and thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I did bring these little packets as well. Um, so you're welcome to, to take one or even take a couple if you need. Um, I don't want you to get scared away with the brochures, talking about abstinence, talking about sexual responsibility, and talking to your teen. Don't let those scare you. There's a couple of different uh, materials in there along lines with some of the grants that we have at the health department, but I wanted to be, be able to bring you a freebie. And relationships can be wonderful and joyful, but they can be a little stressful, so this is a stress ball. Um, and then there's some information in the back as well, uh, some ways that you can connect with your kids at the dinner table. These little fun, um, cut them apart, and then you, it just helps foster conversation, basically. Uh, there's some things in there about family dinners and the importance of that. So please take, take a couple if you want to share with someone else. And you guys have a great day. <laughs>